My name is Mike Parker, and type is my life. My father was murdered. I was 18 years old, and a Quebec jeweler put a bomb on a plane to kill his wife. So the plane took off, exploded, and crashed on land. I didn't know what to do, so I volunteered for the Army and became executive officer of an engineer combat company in Korea and gradually rebuilt myself. <laughs> the Plantin Moratus Museum was the leading printing house of the late 16th century in Antwerp, still running with all of the records. The big thing was their typefaces, the punches and matrices and so forth, were in disorder. So I got permission to put them in order for them. The graphics guru at Dartmouth recommended me for a fellowship. I got the fellowship and I started making myself useful in every way I could think of. And that led me to have keys to everything. And they all went home at five o'clock on the dot every day and I had the keys to everything and could work all night long. And I literally used to, suddenly it would be getting light. Great little moments. Back in the States, I got a letter from Jackson Burke asking if I might like to be his assistant. So I took it to my Yale advisor and said, I've had this offer. I don't know if it's worth doing. He said, you don't know if it's worth doing. He said, that's the principal position in the industry. And I said, yeah, but it's just his assistant. He said, look, he's got flea biters. He's looking to train a successor. It's the central position in the industry. Get your ass out of this office and down there and say yes. And a year later, I was the central person in the industry in my 30s. If you'll forgive the American, I'm the fucking leaveable. <laughs> it took a while to set up, but we met quarterly. Everybody from each company and it was agreed that each typeface would be made at one company only. Monday and Tuesday, we'd go through and decide all the obvious ones. And then on Wednesday morning, I'd see that a little alcohol was served and we horse traded the difficult ones. So each thing was made in one place only of the five companies and put to the other four. And that's how the Linotype Library came to be several thousand fonts. We drew from a who's who list of type designers. Matthew and I were the two big rivals. I used to go to England and Matthew lived up on Canterbury Square in a family house. So I used to go up and stay with him, the competition. But in England, to put it in their phrase, that just isn't done. So nobody need know. So I always disappeared when I went to London, so the legend grew that I had a girlfriend. But it wasn't. It was our principal competitor. And we used to look at each other's versions of typefaces and compare the work we were doing. And I finally decided that he was doing better work than I was. And why not put this act together? I'll run the show and you do the work. And we became the Bobsy twins or whatever. Matt did all the design work and I ran the show as to what was to be designed. The result was history. It was the big Linotype Library.
the change came with F. E. Arazi, who was building the first machines for mechanizing all imagery, and he needed a type library, a digital type library. We met in Tel Aviv, I think, and we put together a deal where he would finance a company to make typefaces as part of his ever-expanding market base. I remember it was midnight on New Year's Eve as we walked home having signed the agreement and we had our own company. The hell with that at the time. He was a great industry name and person and a wonderful cooperation that we put together. David Berlo has been a lifelong friend. When we started back at Linotype, David could do better work for the three different things that make up a good typeface than anybody that I ever ran into. Where without him, it took three people to produce a font. He could make a better font in like a tenth of the time doing all three things at once. And we made it fly. I mean, I could bring in all the work that was needed. And he was just incredibly gifted at turning that into a font, like nobody I've ever known. He now has his own company. And then there was the day I lost my shirt to Steve Jobs on the computer he didn't release with us as a star performer that died. And I only made this mistake once, but I'd put my own money in it to the tune of a million and a quarter and lost it all. I went to a trade show and I was walking through a trade show in Boston and there came David. He said, you know, I think you and I have some things we ought to talk about. Can you come out to the island? Because he lives on Martha's Vineyard. And he offered me way too much money as an interest-free loan. I said, David, you don't want to do that. I'll lose it the way I lost the rest. But how about a job? He said, you mean you would work for me? I said, well, we've tried everything else. So I said, well, let's look at a job description. He took a piece of paper and wrote something on it, folded it, wrote something else, folded it, and handed it to me. And I opened the first fold, and it said, Mike Parker's job description. I opened the second fold, and it said, whatever the hell you want to do. And you can't beat that. And that's the relationship we've had ever since. It's a love affair and has been for 30 years now. I'm a very lucky man. <laughs>